Hello, my name is Kendall. I'm an equity peer leader for the Center for Multicultural Engagement and Inclusion at Metropolitan State University of Denver. Today we will talk about African American Vernacular English, AAVE, its history and modern day misusage. We'll take an extremely brief look. I cannot stress enough that this is just the tip of the iceberg. Entire linguistic careers and college courses focus on the history and development and usage of African American vernacular English. In looking at the history of Black English, we will take a look at a short video about Black Sense and AAVE misusage amongst uh, social media platforms. And this will give us a chance to look at some questions at the end before we go into dialogues. I will do a land acknowledgement and a BIPOC statement, followed by a brief explanation of what a dialogue is with a disclaimer and a trigger warning. Let's begin. Land acknowledgement from the MSU Denver Office of Diversity and Inclusion. Today we honor and acknowledge that we are on the traditional territories and ancestral homelands of the Cheyenne and Arapaho nations. This is an area also the site of trade, hunting, gathering, healing for many other native nations. We recognize the indigenous peoples, the original stewards of the land, let us also acknowledge the painful history of genocide and forced removal from this territory. We respect the many diverse indigenous peoples still connected to the land on which we gather. We pay our respects to them by giving thanks through our continued advocacy for all tribal nations and the ancestors of this place. The BIPOC statement I have written, CMEI acknowledges the BIPOC community through allyship, action and cultural competency. We acknowledge ongoing systems of oppression, socioeconomic disparities, and racial injustices that are experienced by our community every day. We embody allyship aimed at disrupting these oppressive systems through action, support, education, and creation of space for the BIPOC leaders and voices. Thank you for your continued allyship. Very briefly, this material is to be used for a dialogue. A dialogue is not a debate and it's not a discussion. This is a respectful conversation with the goal of idea and thought development with the use of active listening skills to acknowledge another's thoughts and ideas. Dialogues are not a place for hate or anger. We acknowledge those emotions, but please understand this is a space for learning, unlearning, relearning. I'm explaining this distinction to promote healthy communication and conversation within ourselves and with our peers. Please use I statements, own and hone your thoughts because this is meant to be a safe space. Just a couple of highlights for some norms for a dialogue for uh, the activity after this lecture. We are committed to confidentiality. What's learned in a dialogue leaves here but what's shared by ourselves and by peers stays here. This helps to create a brave space where people can honestly engage. Our primary commitment is to learn from one another. We also understand that in a dialogue, we have to accept and expect a lack of closure. This is just the start of a conversation. We will be challenging assumptions and pushing ourselves to think in ways that we may not be used to, which will leave us with lingering questions and thoughts. During the dialogue, please monitor your airtime. Be mindful of taking up more space than others. We want you to speak up, but just note that other people process things differently and express themselves a little differently as well. We will also work with the awareness of status difference within the workshop. We are all coming from different places and that is to be respected. On that note, when we challenge an idea, we challenge just that, the idea and not the person. We don't wanna demean or devalue or put down. We do want to validate lived experiences. And last but not least, we will trust that people are doing their best and that we are co-learners. Last little bit of information before we continue on with the PowerPoint. The trigger warning. This lecture will have racist and offensive, excuse me, images and language. 
Your mental health comes first. Please leave at any time, pause, or do anything you need to maintain mental and physical health. For students at MSU Denver, we can direct you to campus resources. And if you need assistance beyond that, we'll be able to connect you just the same. As a disclaimer, as mentioned in the beginning, this, this lecture is meant to provide you with a basic understanding of, of thoughts and questions. These are dated and cited facts about the development of African-American vernacular English. Now, I've hoped to do this presentation in about 15, 20 minutes. So please note that there are gonna be inevitable gaps as I'm trying to discuss the major changes and events that cultivate our implicit bias and modern Western gaze. Halloween every year, we have to remind people to not do this. We have to remind them not to do blackface, not to wear Native American headdresses, and generally tell people not to embody racist stereotypes or appropriate cultures for a costume. We understand that these images are harmful. Now let's expand this idea of appropriation and the idea around how we interact with cultures as we look at Black culture and the use and development of AAVE or Black English. This is formerly called Ebonex. We are not going to call it that. Black history, Black English history goes back to the beginnings of colonization in the Americas. So something that I do wanna note, because we are going to be focusing on North America's British colonies, the area that would become the United States. So thinking to the 16 and 1700s, what did these enslaved communities look like? Where were these peoples coming from and to what degree were they able to communicate with each other? So those coming from the Middle Passage from Africa to Northern America, they had no real those Africans had no real exposure to English prior to enslavement, and they spoke their African languages and dialects. Another group of people during this larger span of time, we have to keep in mind are what were called, quote, seasoned enslaved folks. And those seasoned folks would go to, had gone from the Middle Passage to the Caribbean or to South America. And in that, they had more exposure to English. And in some cases with British rule, uh, they spoke a pidgin blend. And then from there, from that initial time in uh, South and Central America, they were then sold to enslavers in the United States. The other aspect of the population is the rising Creole population born of enslaved women in the colonies of North America they had the most exposure to the development of white English. The quote that we see on the screen there, enslaved Africans, challenge was not only to learn the language of the slave owners, but also to create a form of speech that was uniquely their own. In doing this, these Africans laid the foundation of what would later be identified as Black English. A few other quotes, thinking of that time frame. In 1710, Governor Alexander Spotsworth reported that slaves in Maryland spoke, quote, a babble of languages, a comment that suggests their enslaved people had difficulty in communicating with one another, sourced from the same book. Something to note is the development of language highlights African ingenuity and self-preservation during enslavement. The common themes of resilience, resistance, and innovation permeate through the African diaspora. So something to keep in mind when we're looking at this brief history is I wanted to highlight some aspects. So we have 1619 with the onset of colonization and enslavement in, the, in what would be the United States. We have the abolishment of enslavement in 1865. Reconstruction began and lasted until about 1877. From 1877 to 1960s, we have Jim Crow. And as this is coming from a university in Denver, I had to throw in that 
Denver public school systems did not desegregate until 1973. Uh, the only thing that's left out of here, which would be somewhere about here, is going to be in 1954 with the win of Brown versus Board of Education, sparking the desegregation efforts. From the beginning of the timeline into modern day, there have been purposeful systematic miseducation and void of proper education for enslaved people and their descendants. When no language education was provided, a language was created to survive. Many people have historically and presently considered AAVE to be bad English. It is not, nor is it slang. In fact, many studies done from 1970s to the present have classified AAVE as a dialect of English or a language of its own resulting from the combination of English words and Niger-Congo root grammar, AAVE as its own word, syntax, and rules. Most importantly, it is a part of a rich Black culture. She's like trying to play a game of chicken with me, where she's like coming at me and like thinking I'm going to swerve like a chicken. But you can't swerve. I'm not going to swerve, not for her. Going to roll up to that way and you're going to be like, bok, bok, bitch, bok, bok, bitch. For years, people have accused Asian American actress Aquafina of using a black scent, which is a manner of speaking used by non black individuals that is indicative of AAVE or Ebonics. Other celebrities like Billie Eilish have also been accused of the same thing. Bitch, I do that too. The fuck? Now, before I go on, I think it's important that these conversations are discussed by people who actually belong to the culture. I am Black. And this is when you're probably thinking, damn, this is the whitest Black dude I have ever heard on YouTube. And to that I say, you are correct. But when you think about it, in a way, this is inherently the root of the problem. What does it mean to quote unquote, sound black? Oftentimes when celebrities or creators are accused of talking black, their speech doesn't actually resemble the average black person. If that was their goal, I mean, they would just simply talk in their everyday voice, which would more closely resemble how the average person talks black or white. But no, what we're seeing instead is a hyperbolic exaggeration of black culture that's being used by non-black creators. The problem isn't necessarily white people trying to sound like a black person. The problem is white people trying to sound like a caricature of a black person, a caricature that is deeply rooted in racist stereotypes. Many of these stereotypes date back to minstrel shows and the bygone era of blackface. Everything from the shoe polish to the big ears to the red lips were all meant to be an exaggeration of black people. It was more than just being made fun of. Our very existence was the punchline. And I think the uncomfortable truth that people don't want to acknowledge is that while we look back and condemn blackface as clearly racist, the mentality behind it hasn't fully gone away. I mean, sure, society doesn't accept people just walking around in black face paint anymore. <clears throat> but we have, however, gotten too comfortable with the idea of adopting a persona that is based on the stereotype of the ghetto black person and have allowed these individuals to use this caricature for clout. And look, I don't mean to get in my Dr. Umar bag, but come on. My For You page is just video after video of white influencers profiting from Black art and Black vernacular. And look, I don't fully blame them. In today's society, cool is currency. And everything about our culture, from our fashion, to our music, to our language, has become synonymous with cool. To me, there is a key distinction between admiration and exaggeration. There's a reason why the Black community embraces certain white rappers and not other ones. We can tell the difference between someone who has a genuine respect for the culture and someone who is simply using it as a character because it's trendy, only to drop that persona once they get bored of it. This in itself is a major aspect of white privilege. 
the idea that you can use a black scent to advance your career, but then drop it once it no longer benefits you. Being black isn't a mask that I can take on and off. Whether I'm chilling with my friends or at a job interview or talking to a cop or just by myself, I am black no matter what. But in all honesty, do I think Aquafina or Billie Eilish or the thousands of TikTok creators that use Ebonics in their videos should be canceled or anything? Well, no, I don't. Nor do I think that all slang should only be spoken by black people. Like I said, the problem isn't white people enjoying aspects of black culture. The problem is when black culture isn't respected when it's treated like a piece of clothing that sits in your closet until it's fashionable to put on again. That is the problem. So, the next time Aquafina wants to do a black scent for easy laughs in a movie, or some girl named Becky from fucking Ohio or something wants to wear fake lashes and say, Yas Queen on TikTok, my only hope is that they're honest with themselves and really ask, what exactly am I trying to achieve here? Like, is the joke supposed to be what I'm saying? Or is it really the manner in which I'm saying it? Because when you allow black culture to end up being the punchline, laughing at the joke also means laughing at us. Uh, okay, everybody wanna be- So we've talked about a few things today. We've talked about uh, the aspects of history and that it goes back to the foundation um, and the creation of colonization in this country. Um, you also have to keep in mind of huge gaps in the evolution that we didn't discuss, but we do understand how it's being utilized today with the fast acting movement of social media. So just some questions to kind of think before you begin your dialogues. Um, there will be questions to ask of yourself of what things you'd like to research that we didn't touch on today. Let's get into some questions. When you think about your interaction with Black culture and with the utilization of African-American vernacular English. Did you speak it in your family home? Think about family gatherings. Did you hear it there? How did you come to understand and hear African-American vernacular? Next question, where and when did you learn it? Was it from friends at school or in the neighborhood or from media or music? This gives you insight into how you are utilizing it when you were exposed to it and gives you a time to question how you even understand it. Because furthermore, when you're thinking of how you're interacting with African-American vernacular and black culture, are you just using it to be funny or entertaining? That's that minstrelization, that minstrel show, that black face that is dehumanizing because it is meant to make fun of and invalidate the black experience. Why do you think black culture is at anyone's disposal to engage with unchecked? So think about what that means, because I hear a lot of these aspects of, well, I grew up in poverty, or I grew up in the projects, or I grew up around black people. So where is the respect? Where is the line of appropriation? Are you doing it in, in a healthy way? The other thing that I've heard a lot of too is with our next question. Do you use the N-word when no one's around? Do you use it around certain people? I see, as we saw with the uh, Asian American star as example from the video, there's this aspect of, well, I'm within the BIPOC. I'm a person of color. So yet people think that they have access to this word and to the culture, just because they're not white. We also have to keep in mind with BIPOC identities, there are white passing people. What image are we giving off when we look a certain way and when we discuss certain things, how we're interacting? If we're utilizing poverty, why are we making poverty synonymous with black culture? These are all questions that want to swirl around your head. Do I have all the answers to? That's where the discussion comes in. Excuse me, that's where the dialogue comes in. <laughs> Lastly, are you using AAVE when you're angry or in an altercation with someone? Because just like the previous question about do you use it to be funny or entertaining, you're putting the 
you're putting these emotions and making it synonymous with black people, with black culture, with black English. Are you in a position to, to increase uh, that awareness on what's happening? Can you use your non-Black or non-BIPOC voice to stop this type of appropriation? How are you furthering it? And just a final thought before you go into your dialogues. When, you're, when your interaction with African-American vernacular English and Black culture gets you praise and laughter, while Black folks engaging in their own culture are persecuted and discriminated against, acknowledgement, accountability, and justice is needed. How are you going to help? 